Okay, so initiative Ute, sustainability in practice, that's what it's all about. We are out in, in, in the wild, in the fields and, and doing, we, we sort of walk the talk. Um, we, we started this uh, five years ago, um, or in fact, lo longer than five years ago, but five years ago, we founded Initiative Uta. Uh, we are four residents here at Uta. Uh, myself, uh, Thomas Jan, my co-founder, uh, Uwe, uh, fisherman at Uta, and Stefan, who owns uh, the Uta Vashus and the harbor and, and, and um, that. Uh, we started, we founded, we, because we saw that we saw one and uh, we could see how it affected, uh, well, the, the life at Uta. When, um, when the water got you know, filled with algae and when the fish disappeared, uh, we could see that there was a, a dip in, in the tourism here, which is essential for little island as, at Uta. And also, which is, which is one uh, important thing, but, but the, 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 the big thing is that, that the Baltic Sea is in a flux, in a negative flux, and uh, that there is a lack of fish and everything that, that uh, uh, Jens told us about. So we wanted to start this foundation to fund to fund uh to make funds to to um uh restore environments and improve conditions and and well make it easier for all living measures to live at the so we 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 asked ourselves could we make something for the baltic sea uh could we start by doing something uh, and as jens and as as the the speakers before me has mentioned uh, the reasons are overfishing. It's about uh, disturbing the habitats of the fish, and it's it's, it's about industrial farming, making the ditches uh, straight from uh, where they start from the from the land or from the forest out in the in the Baltic Sea. And and those three uh, elements has affected the Baltic Sea in a very negative way. So what we see now is is an overflow of of algae bloom. Uh, algae blooming uh, in, the, in the summer when the water gets warmer, and, and Jens also showed the um, uh, the, the status of, of the bottoms, uh, uh, oxygen fatigue or oxygen free bottoms, which is which is uh, hazardous for the for the Baltic Sea. And you talk about something I don't know if it's the correct word, but I think it's 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 an eternal load. Uh, and that, that means that when the oxygen disappears from the, the sea bottom, the phosphorus, uh, the bindings of the phosphorus uh, is released. So the, the Baltic Sea uh, fertilizes itself. So if we should stop every outflow, every ditch, if we could close down every, every farm, uh, around the Baltic Sea, we would still have the problem because the, the, the phosphorus and the sediment is there. And as long as there's too little oxygen, uh, this will repeat itself. So this is something that we have to deal with. The, the wetland, uh, our wetland, one of the wetlands where we are now, this is a, a drone picture from where I am. I'm standing in the, um, uh, you see the wall there and in the right uh, corner of the wall, um, uh, dividing the wetland from the Baltic Sea. That's where I'm standing right now. Uh, the wetland has uh, three, um, it has three things to do. Uh, first of all, it has, it's about cleaning the water. And in at the third, the water comes from the forests and the fields. Uh, we don't have that many horses or cows or, or uh, things at the fields. Now we had it before. So the water is quite clean when, when it uh, runs from the forest and from the fields out in the Baltic Sea, but it's still uh, containing a lot of nutrients. So incoming water is, is collected in the first pond where you see there where it stops and it, it um, uh, leaves its, its uh, phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, and then when, uh, when the first pond is full of water, it runs, the water runs out into the wetland. The next step, where you see there, uh, and in there, um, uh, it it stops the, the phosphor to come to come out in in the sea, in the bay, in in the Söda Floden, as we say in Swedish. And phosphorus mining that's that's uh, a way of saying that you, maybe we could do do something of the phosphorus if we if we dig up uh, if we pump up the sediment. We have tried it uh, here in a small scale uh, to pump it up. 
and to restore the bottom. And if we could do it in a more industrial way in the Baltic Sea, we can make things happen. So this is one thing that we are doing in the wetland. We are trying to mine or at least use the phosphorus uh, to, to put it, to use it as fertilizer in the land-based farming that, that we have, that you can see in the, in the lower end of the picture where, where we grow uh, uh, rocket salad, um, potato, herbs, uh, cabbage, things like that, uh, which is used by the restaurants at the other end, where the restaurant and, and also um, a possibility for, for the inhabitants at Uta to come and buy uh, and support, support our work. We also use uh, the material that, that uh, the wetland gives us because in, in September, between September and October, November, we harvest in the, in the wetland. We take away the, the, uh, the reed and we take away the seaweed and we compost that. And together with the sediment, uh, we, we compose it and we can make new soil which we, which we can use in the land-based farming. It's not sea-based farming, as it says down below there, it's, it's land-based. The second chapter, it's about the fish because the, the, the important thing, uh, the next important thing with the wetland is to have a safe, to, to make a safe haven for, for the fish, for the pike and the perch. Um, and as Jens uh, showed pictures, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, well, the, the, the sticky bags, uh, spigen, as we say in Swedish, uh, they eat uh, small, small fishes when they are below four or five centimeters and they, they eat the rum. So if we can make a safe haven for the pikes and the perches to stay and to um, uh, grow and to uh, get bigger than 10, 12 centimeters, they can be the, the guys or, or, or the girls that eats the, the, um, uh, the, the spig. So this is, this is a sort of playground for them. Uh, and they stay there, they, they start to wander up now. It's because it, they could actually start to wander up now any week, but it's, it's, um, uh, it's really, uh, it's about weather and, and the temperature. Uh, but it could be, this could start in like two, three, four weeks, we don't know, but something like that. They wander up here um, through, the, uh, through this little waterway into the uh, wetland, stay there until early June, and then it's time for fish break, because then we slowly open up the uh, the gate from the from the wetland uh, to make them make it able for them to wander out in the in the bay again. And uh, this to, to the right, you can see an illustration, a picture of of uh, what why the uh, why the per pikes and purchases are so necessary because we used to have a lot of them, and then they were sort of predators and took care of, of the little fish, uh, like um, the sticklebacks and, and uh, the other fish, uh, which means that, that uh, the, uh, the, the, small, uh, the small eaters, you know, the, the small, small animals that kept the, the bottoms clean and, and uh, everything nice, uh, they could work uh, in in harmony, but now there's too little of the of the predators, which means that there's too many of the other sort of the sticklebacks and other fish. Which means that the, um, uh, when you look at the bottom and when you snorkel around, it's it's you know it's different different shades of brown instead of of living a living sea bottom. I mentioned composting. Uh, we are using the. Uh, the elements or, or the material that, that uh, the wetland gives for, for composting, for making soil, which is essential for making, uh, making a small farm. So we can grow the vegetables. And by that, we can close the loop. We can make this a circular process. We can make the wetland as a very important part of, uh, you know, a, a part of, of the circular process. Uh, which means that not only that we can make something out of what, what the wetland uh, gives, we can al also start a process where we uh, grow other things than, uh, than uh, 
than uh, poultry or, or cows or pigs. We can eat more vegetables. Uh, we are, we, we, are uh, we are running three wetlands at Luta, uh, which is fantastic, but we have also uh, added another layer on it. We have a, a um, collaboration with the Royal Institute of Technology because cleaning the Baltic Sea is, uh, is a field where the Royal St uh, Institute of Technology are very, they are working very hard on it. So we have, uh, we have a collaboration with them so that we can make take data out of it. I mean, what is how how much lower does the the outlet of the phosphor? Uh, how much lower is the outlet of phosphor after passing the wetland? And if you can have data on that and nitrogen and other substances, then you can really design a wetland that is perfect for the premises uh, that that is around. So. Cleaning stormwater, that's something that they are uh, on. Uh, how can we clean the water that falls down, that rains and comes from, from the field? The bioengineering bio approach, that is about how can we, uh, how can we um, extract phosphorus from sediment? Can we make that in a cost-effective way? Because if we could, then there would be, um, uh, uh, then there will be, uh, you know, uh, the industry will be interested in putting money and investing in that. And by, by doing that, we could clean the Baltic Sea and make uh, a new industry of it because the mines where the phosphorus is, is uh, taken out right now is in the Northern Africa. And those mines are, they're not uh, eternal. I mean, that the, the, uh, it's, it's a scarce commodity, so to speak. So could we, maybe we could use, do something out of it in the Baltic Sea. That, they're all, the, the KTH uh, the bioengineering approach will give us answer on that. Floating wetlands, that's, that's another interesting thing because this is a, this is a man-made wetland that we have dug out uh, a bay. Uh, floating wetlands is, as, as the name says, it's wetlands that are floating, which is uh, interesting because could that make local uh, positive effects on the uh, on the phosphorus uh, levels could that be a, a place where the the pikes and the perches can grow and have a safe haven well we are just we are testing that together with them blue food uh it's about could we grow uh, uh could, could we grow things uh it's it's a project that is ongoing on the west coast of sweden uh in in the west coast archipelago but could we do the same here at the east coast in the baltic sea well we're looking at that we are also uh we have launched uh uh uh, a conference last year in September, and we are making this a, a yearly event, the Baltic Sea Water Talks. And that's a place, uh, that's a conference where industry, uh, academia, um, uh, philanthropists, uh, and other smart people meet and present a project that, that is going on to, cle to, to clear the situation to make make the make it uh, make the Baltic Sea cleaner, and it, that's very interesting. And it attracts it's it's very attractive. And we are we are doing it in September again. I will I will invite you or send a mail or to uh, to you the organizers so that you are aware when when it's happened when it happens. So we we are that's one thing we do to sort of scale up because that is really what we are do want to do we want to scale up we have three wetlands at Duta. we are standing at the Söder Fladen, which you see on the map we have a little uh, wetland uh, up up in the in the village where the restaurants and and the harbor is and we have one further south uh, but this is this is three wetlands and three uh, sites where kth where we where we do things with kth but we also have designed a model here, which, which we would like to scale up. So, so my message to, to you is that by doing this, we are making a model that can turn uh, three wetlands from, uh, from micro to macro. We, we, could, we want to export our model, um, our Baltic Sea Water Playbook, so that 
uh, if there's anybody out there interested in how to do this from uh, identifying the proper place and what that could be done there and how you do it, how you, um, uh, how you make it, what, what permissions do you have to, to seek for and uh, financing and so on and how you run it. Um, we, are, we are in the making of this model and uh, we would be happy to, uh, well, we would be happy to share our, our knowledge with you. Uh, so that we could go from three wetlands to 3,000 wetlands or, or even more. I mean, because the, from the data, from the effects that we can see here from this wetland and from the three wetlands we run here, at Uta, we can see that the results are convincing. We can see that the water is much cleaner, the fish has returned, and we can close the loop. We can farm, we can harvest, and we can do things with the, with the material that the, the wetland gives us. So, yes, we believe that uh, three wetlands and, and uh, what we do here really can, can save the Baltic Sea, or maybe not fully, but it could be a very, very, um, uh, it, it could be something that really makes a difference. That is what we think. So uh, my, by saying that, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and uh, Thomas and I would be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Robert. Impressing to listen to. And uh, we have received several applause on, on the okay. chat say, saying that this was very interesting. Okay. <laughs> You, we have one question here. Did okay. it take only five years to set up your three wetlands on Uto, and are they fully operational by now? Hello. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, we Hello, started. Thomas. Hi. Uh, let's say, in, in short, it takes one to two years to have all the permissions to do it. Um, have the financing to dig this wetland it took one and a half week uh, first year it was ready in march 2015 and we placed some pikes and perches directly into the wetland because it's filled up with water very quickly so the, the next year in 2016 we lifted in more pikes and perches and after the third third season they went up uh, by themselves yeah so we had the process had started then mm. um, so o o it's always about you know finding finances and permissions to do it uh, to do the work to dig goes very quickly yeah so okay. five years was that's the period that 2017 we we founded the initiative Uther, the foundation um, so we have been, um, so it's not five years, it's, it's not a five year period to build the wetland. It's that we have been running this, this foundation for five years. Okay, I understand. And, and it seems now that, that uh, the authorities will try to shorten the, the time to get all the permissions because, as you said, it took you two years and then mm. it was rather quick when you built it. Hopefully, the other countries will, will follow and, and try to make it easier to apply for, for all the, the, the um, permissions to, to build the wetland. Yeah. It looks very nice out there. The sun is shining yeah. on you. Yeah, it's a perfect conditions yeah. right now. Yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. There seems to be no more questions because you have been so uh, clear in, in your uh, presentation. And uh, I think enthusiastic and inspiring for people mm. all around the Baltic. One more. Great. Uh, if, there, if there will be uh, questions uh, afterwards, uh, please uh, forward them to, to us and we, we, we can ask, answer them uh, later. Here is the wetland and the size of it is approximately three hectares. And in the rear, you can see the inner pond where we, uh, the inner pond is mostly for cleaning up and take the care of the phosphorus. The next step here, here, uh, it's most, mostly the chemical is, biological is the nitrogen. And here is also the pike factory. Uh, 
when the pike goes up here, go back. Okay, can you see the? Put down there. So, okay. can you see the water there? Here flows the water out from the wet, and then here is also the fish ladder where the fish swims up in this here and the fish goes up and for us to have the data we we trap we have a trap here a so cage we, we trap we cage we, we take them they go in here we take take up the pikes and we measure them the sex and we place them in to the wetlands mm. last year we had 100 pikes going up uh, within three weeks uh, it was 50 50 in the sex but, but we can see the last three years, the size of the pike has fallen. Uh, three years ago, it was the, the longest one was 92 centimeters. Two years ago, 86, and last year, 72 centimeters. And what is the reason for that? We think the main reason here is the gray seal. We find a, a lot of corpse uh, uh, Cormorants. Yeah, cor yeah, yeah, dead bodies. Yeah. Pike bodies out uh, just outside here, and um, they often go for the big pike female, which has a lot of rum. So the production is, let's see, we would like to have more big pikes because they have a lot, lot of rum, and they are the producers of a lot of pikes. So let's say 100 pikes going up. If 100 pike going up, uh, the production is around 1.6 million roms. And um, in theory, they say 0.1% reaches the age of one year. That means approximately 1,500 pikes outside the wetland. Yeah. But in that calculation, we don't know if, you know, the fishing, the seal, the cormorant, how that affects this number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now I've got some questions for you. Okay. How much nutrients are removed each year? Oh, that's that's a difficult question. Do you have an answer to that, Thomas? It depends on how much comes in. Really. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of theoretical calculations. You can do it that. Um, uh, we, we can say we know exactly how much because we pumped up sediment out just outside here. Yeah, I'll walk you here. If you see well, the sun out there, yeah. Uh, we took up 470 cubic meters of sediment water and we placed the sediment water uh, above the wetland and the water just flow back into the Baltic Sea and it was cleaned in the wetland. Mm. So after the dewatering, we had 40 cubic meters of sediment, dry substance. And in that, because we know that, because we took samples before we did it, we know we had 50 kilos of phosphorus and 540 kilos of nitrogen. Yeah. And what does that mean? Yeah. Um, let's say a farmer in Sweden has the permission to place 22 kilos of phosphorus per hectare per year and 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. And let's say in that relation, it's a fairly good number. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, and then another one here. If it is an excellent uh, best practice, I would like to get information about how much cleaner the outgoing water is compared to the incoming water. Uh, we have we have data uh, from the investigations made by KTH, the Royal Technical High School, but this, this data is not yet released. It, it will be in a report in some weeks and we can distribute it yeah. to you after yeah. that. Yeah. And we, but we can see definitely it's a cleaning point. Yeah. I, I think it's a very good thing that you actually are co cooperating with, with, with the scientists so you can show. Uh, yeah. In a few weeks, <laughs> the result yeah, yeah. of your work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but then we'll let's end up and thank you very much for an interesting uh, 
lecture and also showing pictures and uh, looking at the wonderful island of Ute. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you for letting us. Take Bye. care. See you. Bye. Now let's move to the second showcase that comes from Finland. And I would like to call on Jenny Jurgen Kalju Mikola from the World Wildlife Foundation, who will talk about recreating wetlands to safeguard biodiversity and improve water quality. Please, Jenny, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Now to the uh, question of showing the presentation. Let's see here. I thank the organizers for inviting me today to talk about a very important sub uh, subject and uh, hearing the other presentations today. I see a lot of potential uh, among uh, rotaries to promote wetland building around the Baltic Sea. And I'm actually quite happy to find out lately that there has been activity in the Porvo Western Rotary Club in this subject. Um, today I will address uh, a bit how the Finnish surface waters, uh, how they look like, what is the ecological status on them, and then go through the threats to our water bodies, uh, to, to freshwater bodies as well as to the coastal ones. And then uh, stress a bit about water management on the catchment level and why this is important when we try to protect the water bodies. To go uh, first to the subject, um, this is the map of Finnish surface waters. Um, we have a lot of waters that are in high and good ecological conditions, many located in the northern and eastern part of Finland. But when we look at then uh, nearly uh, near to the coast, we find that the condition of the water bodies is poorer than that. Eutrophication is the greatest threat to our water bodies, although there are some uh, other threats as well. Um, there has been a lot of uh, lots, uh, lots and lots have been, been done around the Baltic Sea to decrease the amount of eutrophication, and there has been some improvements. Uh, on, on the Finnish Gulf, for example, in the eastern parts after the water uh, water management or wastewater management in St. Petersburg area, the situ or the status of the Gulf um, improved somewhat. But what we see uh, on on Finnish coast has has not really improved the way that we would have wanted to. Uh, water frame uh, work directive dictates that all of our water bodies should be in good ecological condition by 27, which means that there is lots and lots of work to be done in order to get this done. What we see on, on our coast uh, reflects the catchment area where the rivers flow, uh, rivers carry the nutrients and sediment from. So uh, every now and then uh, I hear talk about uh, Russia's wastewater management being the problem that we see on our own coast, which is not true. Uh, the main problem is our rivers on its own. Obviously, there are lots and lots of things on the main, main Baltic proper, but what we see on our coast is our very own doing. Um, we have a grim history of draining our wetlands, mires and floodplains. This happened back in the 60s and obviously the intention was good to get economy running by, um, by adding the amount of forests and by creating um, proper, uh, proper uh, drainage to agriculture areas. But at the same time, we created a huge problem, especially now when climate change is threatening water, uh, water protection. We used to have about 10.4 million hectares of mires in Finland. Currently, we have 8.7, from which 4.7 are drained. And if the video is running properly, we can see that in at the 50s and 60s, there was not that much going on, but when we go to the 70s and the 80s, we can find that the drainage started to uh, widen up more and more. And when we go to the present, we can see that the whole landscape is drained. We have destroyed the natural capacity of the uh, catchment areas to retain water when during these high precipitation events. 
And this is a really pro a, a true problem when we are uh, trying to protect the waters. Um, climate change will add uh, high precipitation events uh, all around the year, but it, especially during the winter time, this is a major concern. Uh, during mild winters, where there is uh, very little evaporation, the vegetation is at its minimum and not evapor evaporating the water to the atmosphere, we are facing with the problem that the river network no longer can contain the water. And when we don't have any kind of uh, wetlands or mires that sponge like hold the water when these uh, when these precipitation events take place uh, the uh, volume of the river network will will run out and what will happen is that uh, the water will rise to the agricultural fields and take a lot of phosphorus with it to the freshwater bodies and uh, eventually to the baltic sea uh, the satellite image shown here is a very grim example from February 2020. Uh, it was a very mild winter and there was a huge precipitation event. And, and this is exactly what happened, that the fields were covered, uh, covered with fresh water that took then a lot of phosphorus with it. Majority of the phosphorus traveling to Baltic Sea comes with clay particles, and we can see from this picture that the rivers that carried that amount to the to the to the sea was immense. During that one winter, uh, the phosphorus load into the, for example, Archipelago Sea was similar to a record-breaking year. That means a whole year. So these events will be uh, really really problematic when we think how we try to build, protect the Baltic Sea. This is how the uh, agricultural areas will look like during these events. Uh, in this picture, the very or the stream that then can't anymore carry the water is a very, very small, a couple of meters, uh, a couple of meter, only a couple of meters uh, wide and can't, tra can't anymore transport the water. So all of these areas looking like lakes are actually, actually fields. And the amount of phosphor phosphorus going forward to the Baltic Sea is very large. Now, this is where, uh, where wetlands are much needed. Uh, we have had uh, in the past four years, three uh, regional projects that has have been focusing on building wetlands. Um, namely Vesien Suolo Neljako, Valuta and Rankku projects. And within these projects, we have implemented these concrete water protection measures. Uh, their uh, budget altogether has been approximately 1.5 million from which Finnish government has, uh, has paid half and, and we have paid half ourselves. The project area is located, located in Western Uusimaa area, about 60 kilometers from Helsinki. And all of the sites have been built on privately owned land in close cooperation with the landowners. So far, we have built 13 wetlands, but also other water retaining structures, such as two state ditches, uh, bottom weirs, and we have also renaturalized some, some, some of the stream beds. I would like to stress now here that these measures that we have done are voluntary for the landowners and in order to then increase them the landowners would need to have some kind of uh, mutual benefits building them so this is really really important to keep in mind this kind of work requires obviously funding coordination planning uh, cooperation with the environmental authorities and municipalities. And very often you hear from uh, landowners that they have thought of building wetlands to their lands for several years, but this kind of procedure to get this actually done from the very planning to the end, it's actually quite time consuming and bureaucratic in a way. So this is where regional water protection projects, such as we're, we're um, we're having on the area now can act as coordinators and constructing, constructing these sites. This is the map so showing the area. Helsinki is showing on the right hand side of, of the image here. Um, two of our projects have been focusing on larger uh, river catchment areas, Siuntia river catchment area, Ingersila river catchment and Inko river catchment area. Little by little, we have added these wetland sites all around the catchment area. So focusing on, on these specific areas. Uh, the 
uh, Ranku project has then um, con uh, concerned on, on the very small near coast catchment areas that don't have uh, larger rivers, but they are very important uh, decreasing the eutrophication as well, but because obviously they're, uh, the water that runs through them goes directly to the Baltic Sea. Uh, as we've heard today, uh, wetlands have several functions that benefit nature as well as human beings. They retain nutrients and sediment, and then I would like to stress they retain the water by decreasing the flooding and erosion downstream of these sites. They also act as water storages during dry periods, which is very, very important as well, because we've had uh, dry summers lately as well, and adding the water into the landscape, it's important during these times as well. All of them increase biodiversity. Uh, the wetlands globally are the most, most threatened uh, biotopes around. So adding them is really, really important in terms of uh, uh, when we consider the biodiversity loss. They are quite beautiful elements in the landscape and their recre recreational values are quite high. I would also um, point out that whether they are built in sites where landowners don't really have other use or on wastelands, I would suggest that maybe the real estate values also would be higher after building these sites. Now, uh, what kind of size should the, should the water, uh, wetlands then be? In order for them to work properly, they need to be at least a half percent of the catchment area above, preferably much, much more than this. Um, and this leads to the fact that wetlands can very, very rarely be built around larger, uh, larger river, around larger rivers, because the catchment area is much, much too much, much large uh, for in order to the wetland for, uh, function properly. So what we have done, we have looked up up the side streams going to the to the larger rivers and built wetlands around them, which has been really, really beneficial to 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 build them and then in order for the catchment catchment areas to be uh, tiny enough and the wetlands small enough. Um, no matter how the uh, wetland is built, whether it's dammed or, or uh, graved, um, excavators needs to be done. This is machinery work that needs to be keep, kept in mind. It's always, uh, we always need very, very heavy machinery when we try to build. Into the examples then, uh, first, um, first wetland that we built was built on, a, on an area which was very moist and wet uh, at starters. The landowner didn't really have uh, use for that area for agriculture or forestry or for any other purposes as well. So really, really a great place to actually build wetland. These kind of wet uh, wasteland uh, areas are really important when you consider where you can actually build them. You don't need to use the very fruitful agricultural area or, or the best forest area for that. The second one was a lot larger. The catchment area above was 250 hectares, also a very good example of an area too moist for intensive agriculture. And so the landowner said that we could then use it for, for a wetland, which became quite nice. There are also hybrid sites. Uh, we can renaturalize the streams so that the water flowing then uh, the, the, the uh, intensity of the water flow then decreases, and you can also build sediment basins around that. So the wetlands don't always need to be very, very big as long as they are uh, proportional to the size of the catchment area. You can also try build them in, in the, the forests. In that sense, they will uh, their function will be uh, retaining the water and decreasing the um, decreasing the um, or retaining them in a way that the downward area won't suffer that much in the in the agricultural areas. And also in this in this case, whether the landowner above will then cut down the forest, this uh, this uh, wetland will then retain the nutrients and sediment coming coming from that. Mm. 
very, very beneficial way to look at this thing is to look at the side streams on their own, very small ones even. Um, you can build uh, several, several sites, small wetlands, two-state ditches, uh, sediment basins around this one stream and comprehensively then take care uh, water of coming from one side stream. So one side stream at a time. Uh, Landowner cooperation is much more uh, or very often needed. Um, many often, uh, very often these sites then go to several landowners areas and then discussions are need to take place. Here we build a two state ditch with, with sediment basing and we are planning to build even two bottom weirs to slow the water velocity down when, when these high precipitation events take place. Bella's wetland was a larger one. The size was 2.5 hectares. Uh, it retains water from purely forested area. The landowner did have uh, uh, ideas to cut down the forest at some point. So, so in that sense, it will protect uh, the water when that takes place. But before that, it retains water once more from one side stream. And uh, it's located very closely to an area where the river is actually quite large and suffers, uh, flo su suffers from flooding during high precipitation events. So very, very nice structure, structure to be built there. We can also, um, also uh, protect lakes. Some of the catchment areas have lakes in, be uh, in between when, before they go into the Baltic Sea. And for example, here it was a smaller wetland uh, taking care of one side stream waters running from mainly from agricultural areas. So once more, a very good example taking care of one side stream waters. Mossan, um, Mossan wetland was built last autumn and once more an agricultural area which was way too moist for intensive farming or forestry perfect site for wetland building. Um, last autumn also we built two, uh, two wetlands in Hanko area, very, very close to, to the actual Baltic Sea, taking care of uh, 150 hectares uh, of area, cleaning waters from there, from agricultural area and also forest, forest area. And last but not least, this week uh, we got finished uh, Grutas and Westerbu Grutas wetlands in Inko. You can actually build them uh, also during the winter time, which, which can be even better because the excavators can, can work better when, when the frost is on, on the ground. So really excited to see how these will look like when the spring, spring comes up. A uh, couple of words about this work. Uh, it's really interesting and you get to see a lot and you get to be really dirty, uh, dirty when you walk in the terrain. It's, a, it's something that I wouldn't change into anything in the world. It's really exciting to see how the wetland gets to be built from scratch, uh, doing all that stuff in between. Talk with the landowners, doing measurements at the field, um, Sowing, sowing the around, uh, around surroundings of the, of the wetlands. Few words. Uh, what I think that the coordinating job should include. Uh, it needs to have uh, uh, a full time employee doing that with some sort of uh, water protection expertise. But it needs to be said that all the engineering work work that we have now. Uh, we have now used is a bot from out uh, um, from out outside of the projects from from experts and engineers. So we do, we do not plan the sites ourselves. You really quickly uh, learn how the procedure goes and how the bureaucratic bureaucratic limbo is is tackled. And so what's really important for um, for taking care of this kind of job is the curiosity also patience and social skills, because you work together with private landowners and they need to be enthusiastic, enthusiastic about, this, about this work. And you, you get dirty every now and then when you, when you do this job, but I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Some take home messages from my presentation. Increasing the number of uh, wetland sites is really, really important when we look at how climate change will pose threats to our water bodies. Um, 
Reconstructing them requires resources and facilitators like, like we have done. Uh, some private landowners do construct it by themselves, but it's quite rare. Uh, catchment area approach is really, really important if we try to uh, manage or protect the waters comprehensively. It's obviously very good to build wetlands wherever you can, but comprehensively look at one, one catchment area and take it from there. I see it as a really beneficial way. The work needs to continue on the area for years in order to inspire the landowners to have uh, enough examples to go forward and deliver result, results. This, also, uh, this is also important when we think about the function of the wetlands. Wetlands work, uh, their work uh, as, as best when they are grown ups in a way, when the vegetation has set in completely. As long as the wetlands are voluntary for the landowners, the interests of the water protection and the landowners must meet. Um, landowners might have interest in, in game, for example. Uh, if they're farmers, they would like to really uh, reduce the amount of flooding on their fields when the, where, where these uh, interests might then meet, or just have, have the uh, responsibility of taking care of the, the water bodies and the Baltic Sea. There is really no point of waiting for the per perfect site if you look at the catchment area. Every built wetland creates a new one if you have a project. And we have worked, worked it in a way that we meet the landowners, we design the wetland, we build it. And really important is to communicate of what's being done to inspire other ones. Next morning, very, very often when we are in the local newspapers, we get a phone call from another landowner that would want to have this kind of site. And then we repeat the cycle. With this last slide, I would like to point out uh, that obviously we all try to protect the very, very fragile Baltic Sea, but we have amazing, amazing freshwater bodies all around the catchment areas which we can protect at the same time when we build enough wetlands. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Wonderful pictures you are showing, as well as giving good advices. We have a few questions to you from the, uh, on, the, on the website. How many so-called historical wetlands could be restored in Finland by the shores of the Baltic Sea? Well, this is an in, in interesting question, because when we look at how, how much we have actually changed the surroundings by draining it, um, I would say it is very different to restore a wetland that was already there than to build a new one. But I don't think there's a limit how much we could then build new ones. There is a, there is a limit how much we can restore the ones that still exist. But when we have enough of actors uh, adding to number of these sites, there is really no, no limit to that. What could Rotary Club, what is Rotary Club's role in different wetlands projects around the Baltic Sea? What can we do? How can we add to your efforts? Well, I would say that really, really important would be the coordinating role. Um, whether you would have then a person who would then, then really take the coordinating role uh, is different, but really important thing was, of course, the fundraising part. In Finland, for example, we've had ha we have had from the government side uh, additional fund funding for water protection programs. But in order to get the money from the government, you would need to have the money of your own. So collecting this money is really, really important. And then obviously I see uh, a really important uh, role in a way of uh, inspiring the local landowners for this kind of job, because rotaries are local clubs. So this could be a really important in the way to uh, inspiring the landowners to build these sites, because we cannot force them to do this. They will need to do that on their own. Wonderful, Jenny. We can see we have a role there. Next question, how long before a wetland needs to be cl cleaned of phosphorus and how would that be done? 
Ah, okay. Uh, very important questions. Uh, obviously, every single uh, wetland needs to be treated and managed. Um, that depends on the wetland and the land use above the wetland. If, for example, the land use, land use above the wetland is only agriculture, the amount of sediment that comes, comes to the wetland might be more uh, you know, might be more intense than, than in the forest wetlands, for example. It needs to be monitored. Uh, wetlands usually have sediment basins that collect, uh, collect the sediment. And when that's uh, collected enough, it needs to be removed from, 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 the, uh, from the wetland. And then it's obviously like shown in the presentation before, before, you need to take the vegetation out at some point. So that depends purely on the wetland, but whether it's built, uh, built uh, under the uh, instructions that it, uh, it, um, the wet size of the wetland is at least the half percent of the catchment area, Normally, you shouldn't do this, uh, collect the sediment away from the wetland at least in five years or so. Okay. So it's not very intense. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. That, this was very interesting. And uh, now we know that the Rotary Clubs has a role to play. Definitely. At least inspiring landowners to, to uh, help us to save the Baltic. So th thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Goya, over to you. Hello again. I had the pleasure to say welcome. And now I have the pleasure to say thanks. Many thanks to all the speakers. Excellent presentations. And many thanks to the arranging team. And many thanks also to all you participants. We really hope that you have learned a lot and that you have enjoyed the webinar and that you also are inspired. We hope, in other words, that we will reach our goal that some local Rotary clubs around the Baltic Sea will take initiatives in building and in maintaining new wetlands. It's a great opportunity and we believe a lot in it. Thanks also for all the positive feedback in the chat. So many thanks to all of you. I will also say some words about the future. Yeah! Thank you, thank you. The next, the next seminar, which we really hope will be a seminar, physical seminar, not a webinar. It's taking place on October 1st in Helsinki. So please welcome and we will of course send out invitation. As you know, the this webinar is recorded and we will publish it on Basran's website, basran.eu, during the coming week. So uh, the 1st of October is the day before the hearing ruin in Finland, in Helsinki. So if you go to Finland, you can participate in both. The so Rowing for the Baltic Herring event is taking place on October 2nd this year in Helsinki. So hope to meet you there and thank you very much for today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Anders. Thank you to all of you. Bye-bye. 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 Have a nice weekend. <laughs>